church and welcome. I hope you feel blessed. I hope you're here to worship. It's a great Sunday to be here. It is the beginning of Holy Week and uh, a lot is going on during that time and a lot is going on here. So with in reference to announcements, we have quite a few. We have prayer meeting tonight at uh, six o'clock. Uh, they'll meet in pastor's office or out front in the narthex. Also tonight for you that are in the choir for Thursday night, rehearsal is for everybody at five tonight. Uh, we have areas to sign up in the Yes Center, wherever you feel your gifts are. If you'd look through that and sign up, it would be much needed and appreciated. I believe Team Kid is uh, needing some meals. Coming up on Sunday the 23rd, we have Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. That's a great event, especially if you've not uh, attended one before. So it's, it's real easy. You don't even have any idea who you're going to eat dinner with. But you either sign up for a host or you sign up as a guest. And all the information is supplied, the host supplies the main meal, you bring a meal to pass and we fellowship. And it's a wonderful time. So that's out there. If you have any questions, see me or anybody else. And it's a great time, so please look into that and check your calendars. Be sure to check your mailboxes. There's an Easter letter there if you haven't gotten it. If you don't have a mailbox, see Lisa in the office and she'll be glad to set you one up. And then everybody else's box moves by the way, so then you gotta find a new spot. <laughs> And coming up this week, uh, we have the uh, choir community service on Thursday th this week. It'll be wonderful. If you haven't been to one before, please come join us for a time of worship and singing. Uh, Beyond the Bunny Brunch is April 8th. And then Sunrise Breakfast, for those who are up earlier than early church, uh, is uh, on April 9th. So before we continue this morning, I'd like to read from Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain consent, but in humility consider others better than ourselves. Each of you should not look only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Your attitude should be the same as, <clears throat> as that of Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we just do pray that today, that we would be humble, that we would be more like you, 
that we would think more of others than ourselves, and most importantly, Lord, that we would tell them about you. We pray, Lord, you'd be with us throughout this service, be with Jeff as he preaches, continue to be with Lisa and Brian as they've experienced a wonderful Palm Sunday in Jerusalem, and they'll be traveling home later this week. We pray for safe travel mercies. Be with us now, watch over us, bless us, Lord, and may we always do things for your kingdom. Amen. Amen. Let's greet everybody and say good morning.
Good morning. It is good to be here this morning on this Palm Sunday. And uh, just a few reminders, if uh, we'll take communion at the end of the service. So if you didn't get a communion cup, there's uh, communion cups at each entrance uh, along with the um, offering baskets if you have an offering. And uh, there's yellow cards uh, in, in the the pew in front of you uh, for prayer requests. If there's any prayer requests that you have that you want the church uh, to be praying for, we'd love for you to fill those out and drop those as well um, in the offering basket. Well, last week um, we started doing a little two-week uh, mini sermon series uh, called "Follow Me," and so we looked at that call of Jesus when He says, "Follow Me." And uh, we looked at the scriptures of some of, uh, I think, seven of the disciples having that call, follow me. Uh, we looked at some others who didn't say yes to that call. And um, some of them were kind of tough scriptures uh, about the, the cost of discipleship and commitment and sacrifice that comes with saying yes to that call of following me. And uh, just a, a funny uh, story uh, after the sermon last week, uh, Becky Fenton uh, texted Andrea and said, I gave that illustration about Bob Goff. Uh, we had gone and seen Bob Goff uh, last Saturday night, and at the end, he said, love is commitment and sacrifice. And she said, did Jeff rearrange his sermon to fit that in there? And I was like, I didn't change a thing, except for I just added at the end, because I was already talking at the end about how following Jesus is teaching us how to love through commitment and sacrifice. And it's amazing how God just works those things out. Um, and last Saturday night, we were hearing that exact same thing. It fit perfectly. It was confirmation on what I was preaching. And so we're going to continue looking at that call of follow me this morning. And again, today is Palm Sunday. It's, it's the beginning of the week that we call Holy Week. And what I want to look at um, more so today is those 12 men who said yes to following Jesus, and for three years they followed him, and, and in that, this really tough week, what it means uh, for us when we say yes, even in the tough times, and we're going to specifically, even more so specifically, look at Peter. And like I, I talked about last week, about the disciples, they, they, they understood to some degree uh, what it meant to, for a disciple to follow a rabbi. Uh, there would be commitment. It wasn't a short-term thing. There would be sacrifice. They would, because they would be following this rabbi 
And, and they had some idea of who Jesus was, although they didn't fully understand um, who Jesus was completely. And even three years later, as we'll see today, they still were grappling with and, and, and trying to understand who Jesus was. But all 12 said yes. And while there were other followers, or even Scripture uses the word disciples for others, other than the 12, by the time we get to Jerusalem this, this Holy Week, basically everybody else has pretty much uh, scattered, or they will uh, for this week, even, even the 12. But we basically just have the 12 and some women who are very, very key figures in this, this Holy Week. But it's, it's about that they are the only ones that are truly following Jesus at this point. And so I want to start out by looking at that uh, Palm Sunday scripture. It's recorded in all the Gospels, but we're going to look from the Gospel of John this morning. It's in John chapter 12, and uh, read from John's account on this triumphant entry of Jesus and what we now call Palm Sunday. So John 12, starting at verse 12, it says, The next day... The news that Jesus was on the way to Jerusalem swept through the city. A large crowd of Passover visitors took palm branches and went down the road to meet him. And they shouted, praise God, or as many translations say, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and rode on it, fulfilling the prophecy that had said... Don't be afraid, people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming, riding on a donkey's colt. His disciples didn't understand at the time that this was a fulfillment of prophecy. But after Jesus entered into his glory, they remembered what had happened and realized that these things had been written about him. Many in the crowd had seen Jesus call Lazarus from the tomb, raising him from the dead, and they were telling others about it. That was the reason so many went out to meet him, because they had heard of this miraculous sign. Then the Pharisees said to each other, there's nothing we can do. Look, everyone has gone after him. Now we're going to dig into that scripture a little bit here in just a moment, but I want to go back a little bit into Jesus' ministry. About halfway through his ministry, maybe a little more than halfway through Jesus' ministry, we see a clear shift that happens uh, in his ministry. It's when Jesus is with the disciples, I believe it was in Capernaum, and he said this, he goes, who do people say that I am? And the disciples say, well, some say Elijah, some say Jeremiah, some say one of the other prophets. And then Jesus asked them, but who do you say that I am? And you remember it was Peter who spoke up. Usually it is Peter who's the first to, to speak. And Peter said, you are the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God. And uh, Jesus affirms that and praises Peter. Um, and then that's when we see this shift. And right after that happens, in that moment, Jesus begins to tell his disciples from then on plainly that it was necessary for him to go to Jerusalem, that he was going to suffer and he was going to die. And, and from that point on, we see the shift towards the cross in his ministry. He's headed towards the cross, and he begins to speak plainly to his disciples. And of course, they don't like it. In that first moment when he tells them, Peter says, never, Lord. And remember what, the, what Jesus said. He says, get behind me, Satan. He said, you're not thinking in the ways of God. You're thinking as a man thinks. This is what must happen. And, and even though Jesus Numerous times we see in, in Scripture, he's telling them they're, they're, they're struggling uh, to understand. They don't really uh, understand what he's saying, and, and he's headed towards the cross. And, and when they said yes to following Jesus, I don't think any of them had that in mind, that we're going to be headed towards a cross. They didn't fully believe him when he was telling them this, or at least understand him. And he keeps nu uh, numerous times plainly telling them, and they just couldn't grasp it. Maybe they thought, you know, Jesus would often speak figuratively. Maybe they thought he was, he was talking figuratively or something. But as we see, the Pharisees and the other religious leaders are becoming more and more angry, even hateful towards Jesus, plotting to kill him. 
They even attempt a few times to try to stone him. And, but Jesus knows his calling. He knows what he's called to do, and he keeps heading towards Jerusalem. Even in, in John chapter 11, um, the chapter before we read this morning, uh, Jesus is, is heading towards Jerusalem, and his disciples are like, hey, don't, let's not go there. They want to kill you. And he's like, no, that's where we're going. And, and Thomas, I think he almost flippantly said, well, let's just go and die with them. I don't think they actually believed at that point that Jesus was going to die or that they would die with them. But they're like, all right, we're, we're following. We might as well just keep, keep going. And so they do that. And so that last year of his ministry, there's this clear direction to the cross. And he's plainly communicating that to his disciples. Again, even though I don't think they really believe him, they trust him enough to keep following him. Maybe it is that they didn't really understand him or I'd say it's a mixture of both. They didn't really understand him. They're having doubts. Like, what is he talking about? And, and I think that's, that's common uh, for many of us. Um, they, they, what, when sometimes when God's asking us stuff, like, do I understand you right? Or are, are you sure, God? And, and so he's telling them this, and, and they're just still working through um, their faith. But they trust him enough. They have faith in him enough to keep following him. And I think that's the key. That's the key. Even when we don't understand God, or dare I say, we don't completely even believe God, or we have our doubts, do we still trust him enough? And they had enough faith to keep following Jesus. And so they get to Bethany, a few miles outside of Jerusalem. It kind of reminds me, you know, the, the big town or big city around here is Fort Wayne. It's kind of, as you get to Huntertown, like you're almost, you know, like if you get to Huntertown, you're like, okay, we're almost to Fort Wayne. I remember when I was growing up, it was, it was White Swan. When you got to White Swan, okay, we're almost to Fort Wayne. So you know what I'm talking about. Now you get to White Swan, and you're like, we've been in Fort Wayne for a while. <laughs> but now, so it's kind of like Huntertown. Bethany's kind of like, we're almost there. So Bethany's just right outside of Jerusalem. So they're really close to Jerusalem. And um, while there, he raises his friend Lazarus uh, from, from the dead, and word is spreading like wildfire. Now, there's two other times in Scripture where he raised someone from the dead. Both of them were early on in his ministry. One was very privately. He told the, the parents that he told the three disciples, don't tell anyone about what just happened. The other one is in a, a very remote area. It's a little more public, but in a very remote area. So there's not a lot of publicity about those other two raisings of the dead. But this time, it's just outside of Jerusalem, a very, the capital city, a very populated area. It's very public. Uh, everybody's out there, or a lot of people are out there and see it. And so it's just spreading like wildfire. In fact, John tells us because of how popular this had made him, he was already really popular, but because of how popular this made, it, made him and how mad it made the Jewish re uh, religious leaders, that was his last act of public ministry before Palm Sunday, what we call now. He retreated to Ephraim. And then now... This is after the first time he's out in public again, after raising Lazarus from the dead, he's entering Jerusalem in what we now call Palm Sunday. And as Jesus is entering Jerusalem, as it's prophesied, on a donkey, there's great crowds praising him. They're, they're even worshiping him. They're praising him. They're worshiping him. They're throwing their cloaks and palm branches on, on the ground before him. That was a, uh, something of respect for a dignitary or someone highly respected because all the roads were dirt back then and so you'd put your cloak or palm branches to keep the dust down as a sign of honor and respect for somebody and they're doing that for jesus as he's coming in on this donkey and verse 18 it tells us that the reason many of them were there was because they had heard about him raising lazarus from the dead and i also believe that this was the final straw for the pharisees they realized their only hope of stopping people from believing in jesus is to kill him because they say this there's nothing we can do look everyone has gone after him literally it says the whole world has gone after him or the whole world is following him if only that were true that would be great obviously that wasn't the case but it felt like it to them as I said last week there's a big difference between admirers of Jesus and followers of Jesus I was reminded this week as I was working on my sermon of, of the um, uh, Eidelman, Kyle Eidelman, 
uh, he calls admirers fans of Jesus. And he wrote a great book. It's called Not a Fan, Becoming a Completely Committed Follower of Jesus. And Kyle Eidelman talks about how many fans or admirers there are, but many are not followers. And so many of these people on this Palm Sunday who are out there worshiping and, and just cheering for Jesus, just gathered there, many aren't committed followers who are willing to commit and sacrifice for him, but they're just admirers or fans of Jesus. And just a few verses after this Palm Sunday event in chapter 12, Jesus even tells the crowds that he must die. And then in verse 17, it says this, and I read this, I believe, last week. It says, but despite the miraculous signs Jesus had done, most people still did not believe in him. You know, that's just an amazing thought to me, that all these miracles that Jesus did, he, he just raised someone from the dead. He'd done that before. He'd, he had healed people. He had cast out um, demons from people. He healed lepers that they, they just couldn't ever, there was no way that they would ever be healed uh, made the blind to see, uh, fed 5,000, another time fed 4,000 from just a few fish and, and, and loaves of bread. All these miracles, and it said few actually believed in. Few had faith. He taught with, as one with authority. And most people were just admirers or fans. Few truly even believed in him. You know, I was trying to think of, of an illustration that would relate to this. And the only thing that could come to my mind as I was thinking of something that would maybe relate was despite the miracle of Farley Dickinson uh, beating Purdue as a number 16 seed, few believed they could win the national championship. And, of course, Farley Dickinson couldn't win the national championship. I don't know why I torture myself thinking about Purdue losing, but it's the life of a Purdue fan. But... Uh, but, you know, I, I wonder if that's, though, kind of how people looked at Jesus. You know, there's been other prophets. There's been others who have done miracles. Uh, Elijah and Elisha. And they, Elisha raised people from the dead. There's been others before that have done great things like Jesus had done. But the difference with Jesus was the authority he had. The, the, he claimed that he was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah. He showed himself to, to, to be that but despite his teaching, despite his miracles, true, few, uh, few believed and had really, you could say, tr few had faith in him. And that's really the difference between a follower and a fan or an admirer is faith, is belief. That's the difference between someone who admires Jesus and truly follows Jesus. Because some of those same people that day that are chanting Hosanna and praise God and, and the Son of David and all of those things, just a few days later would be shouting, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. You see, they were just admirers. They were just fans until things shifted, and then they shifted as well. The difference between the 12 disciples and those women, those few women, simply came down to faith. They had counted the cost. They had recognized the sacrifices they had to make. And, and they, they, there's there a lot of unknowns. Despite all of that stuff, they still truly believed Jesus. They had faith in him. They trusted him, even when they didn't understand. Even when they had doubts, the disciples still trusted him. They put their faith fully in him. It doesn't mean their performance was perfect. And, and, and that's one of the points I want to look at today. Is, is they didn't have a, a perfect performance, but... But the first point, I'm going to list these points at the end. Uh, I gave these uh, points to Brian before I left, so they're at the end of the sermon. But the number one point, and the thing I want you to pick up the most on, the difference between an admirer and a follower is faith. The difference between an admirer of Jesus and a true follower of Jesus is faith. But realize this, just because you have faith doesn't mean you won't mess up. And it doesn't mean you won't fail. There was one disciple, you know, I don't know, it was Judas, I don't know if he actually truly had faith or he lost his faith, and we could debate about all of that. Judas Iscariot, who betrays Jesus. Um, but the other 11 truly believed, truly had faith in Jesus. And so I want to explore this messing up or this failing as we look at Peter, 
uh, who really messes up in Luke chapter 22. And so this is the night that Jesus was, was betrayed. And uh, in Luke 22, we find Luke's account starting at verse 31. Jesus is speaking here. It's after the Last Supper. Um, they're out at the, the Mount of Olives now. And Jesus is with the disciples. And he says this, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to shift you like wheat. But I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. So that when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. Peter said, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you, even to die with you. But Jesus said, Peter, let me tell you something. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. Now, we know from the other Gospels that when Jesus said that to him, Peter vehemently denied that he would do that, that he would certainly die Jesus, but we know in hindsight what's going to happen. Less than eight hours later, probably around eight hours later from Peter saying this, that he would die for Jesus, he denies three separate times that he even knows who Jesus is. I mean, talk about failing. Talk about failing in your faith, that you're denying you even know who Jesus is. Jesus was like his best friend, even. And he denies he even knows him. Um, you know, it seems like failing, to me at least. And, but thank goodness. Thank goodness for the grace of God. But I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that, that even before this, Jesus acknowledges P Peter's faith. Listen to what he says to Peter. I have pleaded in prayer for you, Simon, that your faith should not fail. He, he recognizes that Peter has faith. And Jesus is praying for Peter. Even though he knows he's going to deny him, he's praying for him. And you know, that's a really cool thing. In Hebrews, I believe it is Hebrews 7.25, it tells us that Jesus is in heaven still praying for us today. He's interceding on our behalf today. That's just such a cool thought that Jesus is praying for me, that he's praying for you even today. And we see even here he's praying for Peter. Even though he knows he's going to deny him, He's praying for him. But listen, to what he, but he knows, Jesus knows that this experience is actually going to increase Peter's faith. Listen to what Jesus says. So that when you have repented and turned to me again, strengthen your brothers. This is amazing to me. One, you, Peter, you're, you're going you're gonna to fail, but when you, you repent and you turn to me again, strengthen your brothers. The worst day of Peter's life it's going to be a time that ultimately increases his faith, maybe more than anything else. And that he will be able to strengthen his brothers, his other disciples, when they need him. They'll need Peter's faith. And this should be encouraging to us, that the worst day of our life could be a day that increases our faith like no other day, because we see that in Peter. You see, Peter, for Peter, things are going to get really bad. They're just going to be awful. Peter is going to deny Jesus three times that he even knows him. And when he does that, the ro rooster crows, and Scripture tells us that Jesus looks at Peter. After that rooster crows, and Peter looks at him, and he realizes what has happened, and he just runs away weeping uncontrollably. I can't imagine what was going through his, his mind and his heart, extreme guilt. And think about this, as far as Peter knows, you know, as Jesus is crucified, that the last words that Jesus ever heard Peter say was, I don't know who that guy is. Could you imagine the guilt that Peter must be dealing with as Jesus is crucified, and that the last words Jesus heard him say was, I don't know who that guy is. Man, Peter must have been struggling, and I can't imagine he felt like it could have felt like a greater failure at that point than any time other in his life. But the resurrection changes everything. The resurrection changes everything, and it changes Peter despite his failure. 
So I want to just go back, though, before even that denial for a minute, because I believe that Peter was 100% um, 100 serious that he would die for Jesus. When he said, I will die for you, Jesus, I'll go to prison for you, I think he was serious. But I want to look at what changed that that led him to deny Jesus, and then we'll go then back to past uh, after he denies him. So in Matthew 26, last scripture we'll look at this morning um, is when the soldiers are coming uh, to arrest Jesus in Matthew's account. Matthew 26, starting at verse 47, says this. And even as Jesus said this, Jesus had been talking to the disciples, Judas, one of the twelve disciples, arrived with a crowd of men armed with swords and clubs. They had been sent by the leading priests and elders of the people. The traitor, Judas, had given them an arranged signal. You will know which one to arrest when I greet him with a kiss. So Judas came straight to Jesus. Greetings, Rabbi, he exclaimed, and he gave him a kiss. Jesus said, my friend, go ahead and do what you have come for. The others grabbed Jesus and arrested him. But one of the men with Jesus pulled out a sword and struck the high priest's slave, slashing off his ear. Put away your sword, Jesus told him. Those who use the sword will die by the sword. Don't you realize that I could ask my father for thousands of angels to protect us, and he would send them instantly? But if I did, how would the scriptures be fulfilled that describe what must happen now? Then Jesus said to the crowd, Am I some dangerous revolutionary that you come with swords and clubs to arrest me? Why didn't you arrest me in the temple? I was there teaching every day. But this is all happening to fulfill the words of the prophets as recorded in Scripture. At that point, all the disciples deserted him and fled. Now we know from the book of John that the disciple who pulled the sword was Peter. And if you're willing to pull a sword and start swinging that sword, even cutting off someone's ear, I have to believe that he was willing to die. You pull a sword and you start swinging that and there's a bunch of soldiers there, there's a good chance you're at least going to be arrested, but probably you're going to die. I believe that he was 100% willing to die for Jesus. But yet in just a few hours, it had changed and he was not willing to die, even to the point of denying he knew Jesus. So what I believe changed was what he thought Jesus came to do, what the purpose of the Messiah was. You see, most of the Jews had a misconception that the Messiah was going to come and restore Israel to the glory days of David, of King Solomon, a political king. And you know, there's that story where James and John, and, and one scripture talks about James and John, another, their mother were asking Jesus if, if they could sit at his uh, when he's on his throne, if they could sit on his right and his left, they weren't talking about a, a heavenly throne. They were talking about an earthly throne because they were still thinking there's going to be this restoration of Israel in, in, on earth and Jesus is going to be the king and I want to sit at his right and at his left. They're, they're thinking in earthly manners. And now when Peter realizes at this climatic moment that Jesus is not going to fight, that he's not some revolutionary who's going to restore Israel's political place, that Jesus has actually come to die. At that moment, Peter is struggling. Like, this isn't what I thought it was going to happen. Yeah, he keeps saying he's going to die, but we didn't truly believe it. Like, this is his time to restore Israel, and he's not going to die. I mean, he's not going to fight. And Peter's like, oh, man. And he puts down the sword, and at that point... He's not willing to die for that Messiah yet. He will be later, but he's not at that point willing to die for a Messiah that will go to the cross. You see, even though Peter had faith in Jesus, God still had a work to do in Peter's life, changing his understanding, changing what he cared about, changing, um, transforming Peter's heart, Peter's mind. And it took a tragic event, denying that he even knew G who Jesus was, to help change Peter. And it wasn't just Peter. It was all the disciples. It says, and all the disciples deserted him and fled. The reason the others didn't deny him because they weren't anywhere around. They, they took off. They scattered. Peter was at least kind of hanging around. Uh, but then he denies that he even knows Jesus. 
And I can only imagine that after the resurrection, um, what's going through Peter's mind? Questions, confusion, fear. If Jesus is alive, what's he going to say to me? Like, what's he going to say? I've denied him. I'm not worthy to be his disciple. I'm not even worthy to be his friend. What? He, surely he wants nothing to do with me now. But in John chapter 21, there's this story of the disciples, and um, they're out fishing, or some of them are, and, and Jesus is cooking some fish on the shore, and Peter goes for a walk with Jesus on the beach. Isn't that where some of the best talks happen, right? Right on the beach. As we're, we're walking on the beach, he's walking on the beach, and three times Jesus asks Peter if he loves him. Three times. I think he did it three times because Peter denied him three times. And, and Jesus is so gracious, and Peter's getting frustrated. Why are you asking that? And, and Jesus says, feed my sheep. And then he says in John 21, 19, follow me. Again, he says, follow me. And I want to just pause there for a moment. Brian and I were, were talking about this a little bit before he went to Israel. And he, he, I remember him mentioning this in, in a sermon last year. But I believe Judas was at the same opportunity. Judas Iscariot had the same opportunity that Peter had. He had all the same feelings Peter had, that he had failed Jesus, that, that he had messed up completely. And instead of Judas, instead of waiting on Jesus like the other 11 did, who all failed Jesus as well, Judas took matters in his own hands, and he ended up taking his own life. It could have been so much different for Judas if he had just waited and trusted in Jesus, even though he had screwed up majorly as well. You see, in our greatest moments of failure, God's grace is sufficient. In our greatest moments, moments of failure god's grace is sufficient don't try to handle it yourself don't try to fix it yourself don't try to remedy it, remedy it by your own means wait on jesus trust in jesus come to jesus even in your doubts judas wasn't willing to do that peter and the other ten had all kinds of confusion doubts feelings of failure just like judas did that whole weekend, but by God's grace, in God's grace, Jesus meets them in their failures and graciously restores them. It's such a, it's a, such a great picture of who God is. And it's so interesting to me that Jesus starts his ministry by saying to Peter and the other disciples, follow me. They say yes to that. And at the end of his earthly ministry, he says the exact same thing, follow me. God's grace is so amazing. It's, it's indescribable to really think about his grace. It's so good. Even in our mistakes and in our failures, he keeps pursuing us. He keeps calling us and saying, follow me, follow me. And so I just want to real quick just give the four points for us to kind of remember this morning. Point one is I've already said that the difference between an admirer and a follower is faith. An admirer admires, admires Jesus and like, oh, I, I love Jesus, he's great. But when things get bad, when, when Jesus, because he was going to the cross, when things get bad, an admirer is gone. A follower who has faith, even if they mess up, even if they fail, they're still trusting Jesus. The difference between an admirer and a follower is faith. And if you fail, like Peter did and the other disciples, it doesn't mean you don't have faith. It doesn't mean that the journey's over, like, oh, I've screwed up, it's all over, I'm done for. That's what Judas thought. That's not true. That's what Satan wants us to think. That's what Satan tempted Judas, like, it's over. It's over, Judas, you, you screwed up too bad. That's what he wants us to believe. But when you screw up, when you mess up, when you fail, it doesn't mean you don't have faith. It doesn't mean your journey is over. Number three, your greatest failures can lead to your greatest growth. Because of God's response of grace, in our greatest failures, they can actually be an opportunity for our greatest growth in our faith and trust in Jesus. When I fail and God responds in grace, I'm like, man, what kind of God is this that even when I do something like denying I even know who he is, that he'll respond in love and grace and compassion. And that can change us, increase our faith more than anything. And all of us, as followers of Jesus, have room for growth. I don't care if you've been following Jesus for a day, a week, a month, 10 years. 
50 years, 70 years. No matter how long you've been following Jesus, you have room for growth. We see that later in Peter's life that Paul has to correct him. No matter how long or how close you are to Jesus, there's still room to grow. And that growth at times looks like a change in perspective. For Peter, it changed his perspective of who the Messiah was. For, for sometimes it's changing our perspective of people and how to love people, even people that look different and act different than us. For some, it's understanding the gospel better. And that's why for the last six months, we've been, been, Brian has been preaching on understanding the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And for some, that's our growth. Jesus, though, he just continues to say, follow me. And I believe he's saying that to us again this morning. And so as we come to the table um, on this very special week, uh, the start of Holy Week, this Sunday and, and every Sunday is a precious reminder for us of God's grace. That when Jesus says, follow me, he provides the grace to make it happen. Just think about it. When Jesus says, follow me, he's also going to provide the grace to make that happen. And we see that most vividly, that grace most vividly on the cross. And so as we prepare to participate in, in the bread and in the cup this morning, I want us to meditate on those words of follow me. The grace that he has given to allow that to happen in your life. And then just our response to that grace. So let's just take a moment to meditate on that and then we'll come and take the, the, the bread and the cup together. This uh, Thursday night, we're going to have a, a communion service, and it was on that, that day um, that Jesus had gathered his disciples together in the upper room, and I can't imagine what was going through his mind as he knew, and just hours later, what would be happening to him. And this is his last opportunity before them, be with his disciples, and 
just the emotion that must have been going through his, his mind and his heart as he's sharing the Passover Seder with his disciples. And he took the bread and he said, this bread is, is my body that I'm broken for you. Every time you eat of it, do so in remembrance of me. So let's take the bread together. And if you've ever done a Passover Seder, there's four cups, and there's two after supper, and the one right after supper, and the scripture says, after supper he took the cup, so that would be the third cup, and it's called the cup of atonement. And it's interesting, that's the cup that Jesus took, the cup of atonement, and he said, this is the, my blood, the new covenant. Every time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. Let's do so together. And I'm so thankful, as the worship team comes up, of the love that God has for us, that he sent his son, and what Jesus did for us. And so, if you're here this morning, and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, and you think, man, I'm a failure, I've done all kinds of bad things, and it's terrible what I've done, look what Jesus is willing to do for even you, for any of us, to go to the cross and die for our sins. And so all you have to do is confess that you are a sinner, that you have sinned, you've done bad things. And then it says to repent. That means to turn away from our sinful ways and to turn towards Jesus. That's what Peter had to do. He said, when you've repented, when you've turned back to me, so we, we repent, we turn to Jesus, we're buried in the waters of baptism, and we are a new creation in Jesus Christ. How amazing is that? And so that's the invitation for you. But it's also an invitation for all of us that no matter what we've done, even as we're walking this journey of faith, if we are like Peter and the other disciples, and all of us have at times messed up, we've all uh, struggled, we've all failed, and Jesus continues to say, follow me, follow me. And what a great reminder for us this morning. So let's stand as we uh, sing this song of invitation. You are my everything, you 
As you can see on the screen, today is Compassion Sunday here at our church, and we have the privilege of hearing from Jenga, from Kenya. I always put him in the wrong country. Okay. You guys can be seated. <laughs> but he's going to share how people like us have helped the needy of the needy across the world, but not just providing food, but telling them about Jesus. And his whole family came to know Jesus because of compassion. So I hope you will listen to him and join us in the donut hour and consider sponsoring at least one child, maybe five, you know? Okay, thanks. Well, thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, uh, okay, that's, uh, I'm speaking in tongues. So sorry about that. <laughs> Uh, Buona Sifiwe is how we say praise the Lord in Kenya, and then you say Amina. So I would say Buona Sifiwe. Amina. Amina. Thank you so much. Well, I'm so delighted to be in your presence this morning. Uh, and as we were worshiping, I wasn't even planning to, to do this. I just I was reminded of this verse in Isaiah 43:19, and it says, Behold, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. You know, when I was flying in, I was thinking if I was an alien, I was not from Indiana, and you look down, it's all dry, there's nothing, there's, there's no life. Uh, you would pity the people that live here, and you would wonder, is there anything good that can come out of this place? You know? Um, <laughs> And I think of my life growing as a child in the slums of Nairobi. If you saw me as a seven-year-old boy, you probably have wondered, is this boy going to amount to something? And I felt that when I was growing up. You know, a 10 by 10 feet little house made of tin. There's so many times I wondered, why, why me? Why do we live in this small house? Uh, those nights when I was waiting for my dad to come from work, and it's 9 p.m. and he's not home, we haven't eaten dinner, and wondering, is he going to come home today? I wondered, is life going to be different one day? Is there hope for us? At the age of seven, when I was wondering, uh, why can we afford a dollar to pay tuition fee for me to go to school? And wondered, like, what's going on? Uh, why do I have to uh, be in this situation? And so if I told you back then, in 1991, that God would make a way, and I'll be where I am today, you'll probably have wondered, thought I'm a crazy, I'm a lunatic, or something is wrong with me. But I want to talk about how God has been faithful, and he's been a way maker in my life. Uh, so... Uh, you know, in those situations, wondering what's life going to be like one day. Uh, God was so faithful, he introduced Compassion International in our community. 
Uh, so my local church called Redeemed Gospel Church was a place where Compassion uh, International was started. And most people in the, in, the, in, the, in the village knew in the slums that there is a church here willing to help kids to go to school and feed them. And I was excited. As a, as a little boy, if there was food anywhere, I wanted to be there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was so excited, but I came to realize that Compassion and the church was more than interested in just feeding us. They were concerned about our spiritual well-being as well. We had the gospel every Saturday that we went there. And during the school breaks, during the holidays, we had the gospel preached so many times. But also this was possible because of a family from Oregon, Betty and Boyd, that sponsored me for 14 years. They would write letters to me. They would ask me how I'm doing in school. They would say they are praying for me. I hated that question of how am I doing in school. I wasn't the best kid in school. Uh, I was like, thank you for sponsoring me, but can we not talk about school? Uh, <laughs> but I, somehow deep inside, I also knew that education would change my life and change my family's life. Uh, and God opened doors for me to be able to go to school, uh, you know, elementary, uh, secondary, college and all through to my master's that I pursued down, uh, down the state at Moody Bible Institute. Uh, and all this has been possible because of compassion and people like you who've had stories of other people, other believers, uh, or just God's people who are struggling and are in need, and you've responded. So first of all, I want to thank you as Americans for your, for your generosity across the world. I was in Kenya two weeks ago, and I was just reminded of how our world is in need of God's people that can reach out uh, and remind people that you are loved, you are seen, and there is hope for you. That's what my sponsors did. They reached out and they told me, there is hope for you, little boy. They didn't know I'll be who I am today. I'm married. I live in Phoenix, Arizona. I work at uh, Grand Canyon University where I send college students all over the world to go share the gospel. If you told me at the age of seven that that would be my story, I would have told you you are a lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> like, are you crazy? What's going on with you? But that's how God is in the business of writing stories, of lifting people who are down and, uh, uh, and making him see with things. So today, You'll be able to see packets of children who are already enrolled in a compassion program, but they are waiting for their name to be called one day by their social worker or by their pastor and receive the news, you have a sponsor. And for me, a sponsor was somebody that was so far, far away and was somebody that was interested in changing my life and my family. So brothers and sisters in Christ, I pray that you will respond today and help uh, remind uh, those who are in need, that they are not forgotten, and God loves them. Thank you so much. We're thankful that Jenga came and, and shared his story, and the best stories are Jesus stories. Amen. The best stories are Jesus stories. So I want to encourage you, out at um, Donut Sunday out in the, the gym, there's uh, uh, packets, and, and uh, Jenga will be out there, and I encourage you just to pray about the opportunity to sponsor a child and the difference that it can make. And so as we go to our time of, of prayer, I just want to bless a uh, prayer blessing over Jenga, over uh, Compassion uh, International. So Lord, we thank you uh, for your goodness, for your grace, for your mercy. We thank you that you're in the business of transforming lives, of changing lives. And Lord, that you invite us to be a part of that. And uh, Lord, I'm thankful for this family in Oregon that sponsored Jenga and the difference that made in his life. And so, Lord, we have that opportunity as well. And so I just pray that if there's anyone here that you want to take that step of faith and sponsor a child, that they would do that. But I also just want to pray over Jenga. I thank you for the ministry, how you're using him um, in Arizona and all over the world. And uh, I pray a blessing on him. And I just pray a blessing on Compassion International. Lord, would you continue to use them to make a difference in people's lives all around the world, most of all, that they would hear the gospel and uh, be transformed uh, into a new person by you. So we just lift them up to you. I lift up every other concern, every other praise to you, Lord, this morning. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.